Good evening, everybody. Good evening. And uh, we would welcome those that might be listening online and if they would come join us and be blessed as we're expecting the Lord to bless us tonight. Amen. We're going to start with uh, there is power in the blood. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood. birthday boy, Bill Studley. I'm not going to tell you how old he is, he can tell you that, but he's getting up there. And we're glad that he's going to spend uh, his evening with us. So we'll sing happy birthday to him. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday now you can acknowledge those around you with a, a wave. The wave. All right, we're going to continue singing with He Keeps Me Singing. Thy faithfulness. Oh, 
Thank you, Neville. Thank you, Marlene. Good to see you all here tonight. We're all kind of turned around, but it, it's good to see you. Glad you're here. I want to thank Pastor Jared for uh, making sure that we're uh, online tonight. Thank you, buddy. Really appreciate it. It's a lot of work, and uh, we deeply appreciate it. Neville, thank you. Marlene, we appreciate our worship team. We are so glad you're here. It's good to see. Well, it is. We see your smiling faces somehow. <laughs> it is good to see you, and we're thankful for this privilege to be together. Let's have a word of prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful time together tonight. We give you praise for who you are. We thank you for being the God who is alive. Hallelujah, you're alive. And we give you praise. We ask now that as we spend this time together that you would be glorified, our lives would be strengthened in you, and that we would leave this place with the joy of you in our hearts and the glory of your story on our lips. Thank you, Father. We give you praise in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Right now I'm going to ask Na if she would kindly come. We're going to pray for the persecuted church. And then following Na, we're going to have our, our wonderful saxophone duet come and play for us. So man after Na, would you please come? Na. Good evening, everyone. Tonight evening. we're praying for Iraq, the believers in Iraq. Iraq ranks, uh, ranks at 15th in the World Watch list. Now, according to the World Watch list article that speaks of the... I need to go. <laughs> there, is that better? Okay. Um, according to the World Watch list, there's an article that speaks about the trend of persecution. And the Christian in the Middle East are being recognized as diminishing in size. So before 2003, there were 1.5 million of believers in Iraq, and now there's only about two, maybe a little more than 2,000 believers are left. Um, so that's an 87% reduction. But it also mentioned that there are some believers are returning to rebuild their lives in their home there. So let's pray for them. Uh, this morning, I had the privilege of uh, listening to Pastor Jared, and I was struck by his teaching that uh, all things are possible with Jesus. But when he read the point of uh, in Mark 9, when he read about how Jesus lifted the boy up when people thought he was dead. So let me read that, and then we'll pray. I'll start with verse 25 from Mark 9, 25. When Jesus saw that the crowd were running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying, You mute and deaf spirit, I command you to come out of him, never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsion him terribly, it came out and the boy was like a corpse, uh, so that most people said he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, we do believe that all things are possible with you. And even as we saw the 80% reductions of Christian in the Middle East, specifically in Iraq, we know that you can restore and rebuild. Just like we saw how everybody thought that young boy was dead, you took him by the hand and lifted him up and he rose. So I'm asking that you take each believer by hand, lifted them up out of their broken homes, broken lives, Father, and bring complete healing, that as they rose up, that the testimony of Jesus would be even greater in the Middle East than ever before. We do ask for your supernatural protection and provision, for they face many challenges, from security, from health, from employment, to education. You are mindful of all needs, so we commit the believers in Iraq into your hand, and we ask in the name of Jesus that you would glorify yourself. We also ask them that their Muslim neighbor would come to faith at the testimony of these faithful believers trusting in Jesus. And I thank you again that Iraq believers will be strong and rose up with you and not diminish in size or in faith in any way. In Jesus' name I pray. Thank you.
I'm going to unmask because I have to do that in order to play my horn. <laughs> now maybe after the first note you'll tell me to put the mask back on, but it's so loud up here I won't be able to hear, so we will do that like this. The song that we want to play this evening uh, is a uh, spiritual, there we go. I, I did this and put it on the phone, so I was trying to be so proper. This is a brand new phone, because my other phone was my wife's, and it, it just what didn't work anymore. And so my brother, my son-in-law went out and bought me a phone. He gave me the bill for it, too. But he bought, me, <laughs> bought the phone back, and he set it up, and now I can't, um, I can't find it. Let me try it again here. There. All right. The best laid plans of mice and men. Anyway, the song that we are going to play is called Deep River. A deep river, um, uh, I have the lyrics here for you, but they disappeared, just like everything else they do on the... The mask back on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait a minute. So put the mask back on, so... Yeah. I'm going to get, I'm going to poke this one more time to see if it'll work. <laughs> I want my money back. All right, anyway. Uh, Deep River, we were going to do it at the end of March, but we know what took place at the end of March, and so this has been uh, on, on the wait list for a long time. I hope you enjoy it. Um, I'd love to have you hear the lyrics, but they've disappeared. Do you have the lyrics? Oh, Bless you. Joy Somebody who knows wind. how to use this. <laughs> Deep River, here it is. Just very short. Deep River, my home is over Jordan. Deep River, Lord. I want to cross over into campground. Deep river, my home is over Jordan. Deep river, Lord, I want to cross over into campground. Oh, don't you want to go to the gospel feast, that promised land where all is peace? Oh, deep river, Lord, I want to go over to, into campground. And campground uh, is a mention of what turned out to be in Mobile, Alabama, as a um, African-American uh, uh, base there during the, the Civil War. So the refuge that these people were going to take is like the refuge that they were going to get looking forward to going to heaven. Thank you so much.
<laughs> it's wonderful to have God's music, isn't it? Amen. Amen. It sure is. Would you kindly take your Bibles and turn to John chapter 11? While you're turning, let me share a few thoughts with you tonight. We know that our world has seen uh, what we call power brokers or people who are people of power. They may be in the government, society, or military. And because of who they are and what they do, they've gained a lot of respect. <laughs> they also have people who fear them. But as I think of people of power, there's no one like our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. He is the all-powerful one. And as we continue in our series, Living for the Master, we're going to talk tonight about the power of the Master, the power of the Master, and how thankful I am that we have a Savior who is all-powerful. Today, as we struggle with things, I want us to realize that the Lord Jesus Christ, in many ways, makes His power known to us so that we not only can live with the difficulties that we face, but we also can glorify Him as we do it. When I was in college, one of my professors started every class with this statement. He said, life's tough. <laughs> and we kind of thought, my goodness, couldn't we start with something a little more harmonious or <laughs> a little more encouraging? But we soon learned that life is tough. And as we go through life, we realize that uh, our strength, our sanity, our endurance is taxed to the max. And it's at those times that we realize that our absolute weakness or the absolute weakness of our so-called strength is made very real to us. We realize that we do not have what we need. As I thought of that, I couldn't help but think of what the psalmist tells us in Psalm 46.1. He says, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Well, many of you know John chapter 11 very well, and it deals with a family, a family that had a great deal of trouble, just like you and I have experienced in our lives tonight. And we're going to see this week and next week how the Lord Jesus in his strength ministers to their need, and I trust you realize how he wants to minister to your need as well. Look with me, please, John chapter 11, and I'm beginning to read from verse 1. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Martha, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, yet when he had heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. Then he said to his disciples, Let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, A short while ago the Jews tried to stone you, and yet you are going back there? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? A man who walks by day will not stumble, for he sees by this world's light. It is when he walks by night that he stumbles, for he has no light. After he said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe. But let's go to him. Then Thomas called Didymus, meaning the twin, said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word tonight. We pray now that as we spend these moments together that you would speak to our hearts, draw us close to you, and enable us to see once again just how glorious you are. And we give you praise 
In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. As we look at John's testimony of the Lord Jesus, we see that he proclaims the Lord Jesus as the sovereign ruler of the universe. He is the God of all power. Before we come to John chapter 11, John has told us about six mighty miracles which the Lord Jesus has done. He's turned water into wine, healing the nobleman's son, restoring the impotent man, multiplying the loaves and fishes, walking on the water, and then curing the man born blind. But as we come to John chapter 11, we come to the epitome of the power of the Lord Jesus Christ as he raises Lazarus from the dead, a man whom we will see next week was in the grave for four days before the Lord Jesus raised him. Now John often uses the word sign when he talks about the miracles of the Lord Jesus, and he does it for a particular reason. To John, the word sign not only talks about the miraculous things which Jesus does, but it tells us of a spiritual truth which the miracle gives to us. And so as we think of our Lord's miracles, it not only makes known His great power, it not only makes known His spiritual truth to us, but it also tells us that He ministers specifically, personally, to us. Aren't you glad that our God is a personal God? A God who knows us? A God who knows everything about our problem and ministers to our every need? I have down here my first point, before you and I are even aware of the difficulties that we are about to face, He already knows what to do and He has the answer for which we are seeking. Now some of you are saying, I wish He'd let me know what that answer is because I've been looking for quite some time. Well I want you to know that in His time, He will let you know what that answer is. As you and I deal with the sorrows of life, we understand from God's Word that our God is a God of great compassion. And as I think of compassion, I think what the psalmist tells us, Psalm 103, verses 13 and 14. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear, who revere Him. For He knows how we are formed, He remembers that we are dust. That word compassion is a tremendously interesting word to us. It talks about a, a deep sympathy, a sorrow that one feels for another who is in deep affliction. But not only do they feel the deep affliction, but it's accompanied by a desire to help relieve the problem that they are experiencing. Dear family, our Lord is one who has deep compassion upon you and me tonight and how thankful I am. I'm a sinner saved only by His grace and He took compassion upon me and by His grace He took compassion upon you. Amen. He most certainly did. His compassion is an overflow of His love for us. Also in that passage of Scripture I just read, it ends with the word dust. Dust is dirt underneath our feet. It talks about our vulnerability, how easy dust is broken. And yet our God realizing how easily we are broken, He takes compassion upon us. As I think of compassion, Lamentations 3, 22 and 23 says this to us. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is thy what? Faithfulness. Thy faithfulness. Hallelujah. Great is God's faithfulness to us. Well, we see in verses 1 through 3 of John 11 that there is a great need. The head of the family is sick. He's near unto death. And I like how John says it in verse 3. He says, he says, the, the, the sisters Mary and Martha say to the Lord Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. Now our Lord's response lets us know that he is totally aware of their situation. Have you ever wondered when you're in the deep throes of a problem if God knows about your situation? 
be honest, you ever, you ever had that feeling? I sure have. Lord, do you really understand what I'm going through? Lord, do you know that this is beyond me and I can't handle it myself? He does. He knows all about it. And as we look at verse 4, we realize he did know all about their situation. When he heard this, Jesus said, This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. This is a tremendous spiritual truth that we, un we need to understand. God's difficulties are not given to hurt us. They are given to us that we might draw closer to the Lord and that glory might be brought to His name as you and I go through the tough time with Him. Now some people have said there's a discrepancy in what is said here. In verse 4, it says, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. But then in verse 14, Jesus says, Lazarus is dead. There's got to be a discrepancy. No, there isn't. We have to read the verse correctly. The Lord Jesus said in verse 4, this sickness will not what? Yeah. End yeah. in death. So the word we pay attention to is end. Let's face it, when you and I are in the midst of difficulty, we want to know, and we want to know it now, the next step. We want to know that it's going to turn out, and we want to know how the next step is going to unfold. But you've probably experienced, as I have, that as we're facing these difficulties and seeking God's will, He shows us His will one step at a time. One step at a time. Well, why does He do that? Why doesn't He show us all the steps at one time? Well, there's the word wait. How many of you like to wait? I don't see any hands. <laughs> we don't like to wait, do we? Well, when we wait on the Lord, it strengthens our faith in Him. It builds our character. It also helps us to be resolved to let Him have His way with us. Psalm 27, 14 says this, Wait for the Lord, be strong and take heart, and wait for the Lord. Also, Isaiah 40, 31, a verse that many of us have known for years, But those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength, they will soar on wings like eagles, they will run and not grow weary, and they will walk and not be faint. Four wills, four wills that God will do in our life as we wait on Him. When we wait on the Lord, He makes all of these things possible. I have several questions for us tonight. My first question is this. Are you and I being careful to wait on the Lord for the answer for which we're seeking? If we're waiting on the Lord, then by His grace, He will strengthen us not only to go through the difficulty, but also to wait for what He wants us to do. Well, when we think of the word wait, it's kind of interesting as we see the Lord has heard His dear friend, whom He loves, is near death. And yet God's Word tells us He waits two more days. Well, why would He wait? Why would He wait when His friend Lazarus is at the brink of death? Well, as I'm thinking of this, I couldn't help but think of another situation many years later. In fact, it was 1956 in January. Remember when the five American uh, missionaries were killed by the Alka Indians? Remember that? I remember I was in the back seat of our car. We were on our way from Montebello to Riverside. It was the evening news. Our car radio was on. And I remember that story. And as a 12-year-old as a young man, I was deeply disturbed that these men's lives were taken. Then many years later, I heard what Elizabeth Elliot, her husband Pete Elliot, was taken that day. I heard what she responded when she heard that her husband had been speared through by an Alka tribesman. She didn't question, she didn't ask why, she wasn't angry, she wasn't bitter. Her statement was this, let God be God. Now think about that. Your lover, your husband has been killed. The father to your children has been taken from you. And yet her statement, let God be God. In other words, 
she was willing to let God's plan work out not only for him but for her she didn't question his plan or his purposes in other words she wanted God's will to be done so as I think of Jesus waiting two more days before he goes to see Lazarus it was for his will to be done and for the people to understand why he waited but then also there's a practical reason why the Lord Jesus waited back in Jesus day the Jews had become very superstitious people and they had allowed other cultures to influence their thinking especially as it regarded spiritual issues a case in point was they erroneously believed that when a person died that the soul hovered over the body and if that soul which hovered over the body came back into the body within three days then the person would come to life if the Lord Jesus had immediately gone when he heard about Lazarus being sick and done the miracle the people would have just said this is no miracle the soul was hovering over the body it entered in Jesus has really done nothing spectacular but he had he had raised Lazarus to life after he had been in the grave for four days well in verse 8 the disciples were surprised that even after the Lord waited two days that he was going to go to Judea why it says this in verse 8 but rabbi they said a short while ago the Jews tried to stone you and yet you were going back there May we realize that the Lord Jesus has all power, power to combat the forces of evil. He has power to do what needs to be done to minister to your need and my need. We say what needs to be done can't be done. It's beyond us. But our God has all power. Well, notice please what the Lord says in verse 9. He says, walking in the light he says, but Rabbi, they said a short while ago, the Jews tried to stone you, and yet you are going back there. Our Lord says, he who walks in the light, talks about walking in the knowledge of God's will. This is something that the Lord Jesus always did. He walked in the knowledge of his Father's will. I don't know about you, but there are times in my life when I kind of wonder what the Lord's will is. Well, I need to submit to Him as the Lord Jesus always did. Well, as you and I journey through life, we most certainly encounter hardships. And even the decisions we make regarding the decisions we face may bring us difficulty. We're tempted to work out our own deliverance. But if we seek out and follow God's will, we need not fear the outcome which may come our way. Well, would you now look with me, please, as we, as we uh, come to the end of this first point. No matter what awaited our Lord as he journeyed to minister to Lazarus and his sisters, he was going to follow his Father's will. A second question for you and me tonight. Are you and I following God's will for our lives? Are we literally seeking to follow his will for our lives? I remember when I came back from seminary some years ago and there was no opportunity in the ministry and a buddy of mine said hey Rod you need to come down to LAPD they're hiring so I went down to LAPD and I went through that whole long process it's a horrible process it took me a year and a half psychiatric testing other testing physical agility skills I'm running up and down the streets of Whittier. I'm pumped. I'm ready to go. After a year and a half, I'm selected. I'm one of 300. I'm going to be an LAPD officer. Start the academy. And then, the next day, we're told that they can't hire us because they don't have the money to train us. I was so upset. I didn't know God's will for my life. Lord, what are you doing to me? I really need a job and this seemed like it was going to work out. And now you've taken that away. Perhaps as you look at your life tonight, you wonder what God may be doing with your life. God knows what he's doing and he will make it known just as he did to me. Just as he's going to do with Martha and Mary and Lazarus. 
In verses 11 through 14, the disciples have misunderstood the Lord's words about going back and seeing Lazarus. But the Lord Jesus had a goal for them. He waited, and would you look with me at verses 14 and 15. This was His goal for them as He waited before He went back to see Lazarus. So then He told them plainly, Lazarus is what? He's dead. And for your sake, I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to Him. What was His goal? What was His plan for these disciples on that day? His goal was that they might have a deeper faith in Him as the Messiah and the Son of God. Dear family, whenever you and I go into deep experiences in our life, the Lord doesn't bring these things to hurt us. He brings these things to strengthen our love and our faith in Him. If you're going through a trial today, know this. The Lord indeed does have an answer for you. He does. And as we seek Him out, He will make it known in His time. Would you now look with me at verse 17, please? On His arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days days. Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them on the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have what? Died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. As we consider Martha's response to the Lord Jesus, we see that in the midst of her great sorrow, her faith in the Lord Jesus did not diminish. I don't know about you, but like I mentioned the situation with LAPD, I was really shook to the foundation of my life when going through all of that turmoil of doing what they wanted me to do and being accepted. And then I was, I could not start. And I said, what do I do now? They says, wait six months, oh reapply, do everything all over again. And if you're in the top 300, you can start if we have the money. Yeah. I thought, Lord. <laughs> What are you doing with my life? Well, I will be honest with you. My faith in the Lord at that point was shaken. It was really shaken. I wondered, Lord, do you really know what you're doing? <laughs> do you really know what you're doing with my life? May I share with you that Martha knew exactly who she believed in, and that was the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 17, John made sure to mention that Lazarus has been in the tomb for four days. He did that so that the magnitude of the miracle that the Lord Jesus was going to do with Lazarus would be known to the people. This was no accident. This was no soul hovering over the body for three days and then coming back in. This was a wonderful, awesome miracle. Well, in verses 18 and 19, we once again see that nothing keeps the Lord Jesus from ministering to those in need. He is going back to, to uh, Bethany near Jerusalem. The religious leaders were seething with hatred towards the Lord Jesus, but nothing was going to keep him from ministering to the life of his child. And nothing will keep the Lord Jesus from ministering to your life and my life tonight. As I think of Martha having her, her faith strong in the Lord Jesus, I think of myself and others that have talked to me. We know what God's Word says, but have you perhaps noticed in your life, even though knowing what God's Word says when you come upon a difficult time in your life, you want to make your own way of escape. You want to find your own answer. And finally, after everything you've done has failed, then then you turn to the Lord in prayer. You seek His will, His answer, His solution. Thankfully, Martha knew exactly where to turn, and that was to her Lord. Her hope, her strength, 
was totally in the Lord Jesus. He had proven himself faithful in the past, and he was going to prove himself faithful even then. It's been Joyce's and my privilege these last almost 20 years to be with many of you through the deep trials of your life, and I can't begin to tell you the testimony that you have left with us. You went through those difficult times. You put your trust in the Lord. You're trusting Him now, and you'll never know what a testimony that has been to us, how we praise the Lord for you and thank you for your faithfulness to Him. Well, in verse 22, Martha makes a statement to the Lord Jesus, to me, that is powerful. She says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But now in verse 22, she says this, But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Wow. God will give you whatever you ask. Now, some have stated that Martha is asking the Lord to bring her brother back to life at that very time. But when we look at her response in verse 39 next week, she says this, the Lord says, take away the stone. She says, but Lord, by this time there is a bad odor for he has been there four days. Well, if she's not asking the Lord to resurrect her brother at that time, what on earth is she asking him for? Well, she knows that the father hears the prayers of his son. She's trusting the Lord Jesus to bring some good out of a very, very difficult situation. But we also realize as we look at verse 23 that... Uh, she realizes her brother's going to rise again. Look with there, verse 23 and 24. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again. Notice, in the resurrection at the last day. But now look with me at verse 25 and 26 because there's a great lesson which the Lord is wanting to teach Martha between verse 24 and and verse 25 and 26. Then Jesus said to her, I am, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Martha says, Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who was to come into the world. What an awesome statement. In the midst of the loss of her brother, the head of the family, back then the head of the family dies, you can be in big trouble, especially if you're women. They were a wealthy family, but still without that man covering, it would be difficult for them. But she believed that Jesus was exactly who he said he was. He was the God of all creation, the Savior, the one who was to come into the world. The Lord Jesus wanted her to realize that He is the God of all power. Notice, please, that the Lord Jesus does not merely say He will bring about the resurrection or He will be the cause of the resurrection, though both those statements are true. Notice how He says it. He says that He is the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. This is the fifth of the great I am statements that John records for us that the Lord Jesus says in his gospel. This is a this is a 100% claim to deity on behalf of the Lord Jesus that he's one with the Father. It takes us back to Genesis 3:14 and 15 when God spoke to Moses from the burning bush. God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. 
the Lord Jesus as one with the Father is eternally the great I am. God's word clearly proclaims his, his resurrection from the dead and receiving eternal life in him are all embodied in him. There's no other way to have peace with the Father. No other way to have forgiveness of sin. No other way to have eternal life except through faith in Jesus Christ. And according to verses 25 and 26, the one who places their trust in Christ even though they die physically will never die spiritually, hallelujah, and they will be raised to life to spend eternity with Almighty God. How many of us have family and friends that are already in glory? All of us. Dear family, we're waiting to see. I'm waiting to see my parents. I'm waiting to see my grandparents. I'm waiting to see Jimmy, one of our young men here who died at 23 with uh, leukemia. We have a God who's the God of all power. And His name is Jesus Christ. What a glorious promise He made to Martha and Mary and to all of us down through the centuries that through faith in His name, you and I can be assured of a home in heaven with Him. For the one who has faith in Christ, there's no hoping of eternal life. No, there's no having to work for it. No, it's the blessed assurance that through faith in Christ, because of what He did at Calvary's cross and rising again from the grave, we have eternal life in Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, the Lord was seeking to move Martha from an abstract belief in resurrection. He will be raised again at the last days to the point, I am the resurrection and the life. Martha will soon realize that as she sees her brother come out of the tomb, grave clothes on. He's been there four days. They said he would stink. And yet, <laughs> here he is, alive, in front of them. Hallelujah. She would then have a personalized trust in the Lord who alone could raise anyone from the grave, and especially her dear brother. It was, as the psalmist said in Psalm 147, 5, Great is the Lord, and mighty in power. His understanding has no limit. Next week we'll see that powerful miracle as he raises Lazarus from the grave. What an awesome moment that was. What an awesome thing it is to read of this new life which God gives to this dear man. But as we close tonight, may I leave this statement with you. Faith in Christ sets no limit on His power and submits itself to His will. Faith in Christ sets no limit on His power and submits itself to His will. This week as you and I are looking for His will, that may be that you and I have to wait. And we have a hard time waiting, but know this, if we're waiting, somebody's already there ahead of us, and that's the Lord Jesus, and He will show us the way. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You for Your great Word. We're thankful, Lord Jesus, that we have You, the power of the Master. That's our message tonight, the power of the Master. It only resides in You, Lord Jesus. And we thank You that by Your grace You love us and You make Yourself known to us. As we go through this week, may we allow You to lead us even as we wait on You. Thank You, Lord. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Neville, please come and lead us. We're going to sing a song called In His Time. Let me read the words to you. In His time, in His time, He makes all things beautiful in His time. Lord, please show me every day as you're teaching me your way that you do just what you say in your time.
Let's sing together. tonight and those of you at home we're so glad that you've joined with us pastor jared can you break away from the camera there <laughs> i'd love to have you come and, and close our time in prayer please awesome raj hey thank you once again for just coming out tonight and just sharing with us in worship sax guys yes. oh my goodness that was amazing and we have people actually responding on facebook i think your daughter gary chimed in and said great job dad <laughs> So praise God for that. You know, we're, we're trying this technology thing, and God is gracious to us. If you missed it this morning, it will be up on YouTube later on. I promise you that. One of these days, we'll get it all together. But God bless you guys. Thanks, Raj, for bringing the word tonight. Awesome, awesome. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for who you are. We thank you that in your time, you make all things beautiful. That in your time, you make all things work out in accordance with your will. That even though things may not seem to go our way, it's because we lack perspective. And as we step back and look at things through your eyes, Lord, we can see that you've been working all along. When we miss that set of footprints in the sand and we thought we were trudging through the sand on our own, we should have recognized that it was you who were carrying us because that is what you do. You carry us, you sustain us, you give us strength when we are weak, and we thank you for that. Lord, thank you for your word tonight, which has spoke volumes into our lives. May we take the lessons that we have learned and trust in you this week, that in your time, you are good. And we praise you in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. 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 God bless you, dear family. Thank you.